I'm Keith McCullough and welcome back to the Investing Summit. We're going to meet with the uh, man, the myth, uh, the legend, Brian McGough, the guy who's been one of my partners since the very beginning. Uh, for those of you who haven't followed him on Twitter, it's at Hedgeye Retail. That's where you can find uh, a lot of his flow and he's got a lot of flow when it comes to ideas, long and short. Brian thinks big and uh, this session is going to be a lot about the macro meeting the micro or us top-down macro people being Darius and I and Brian McGough being the sector head professional who's picking stocks from the bottom up. So uh, yeah. thanks for doing what you do and maybe a good spot for you to just kind of take 10 minutes, five, 10 minutes and go through what you see out there today. Got it. Got it. Cool. Thanks. So I want to walk through a couple of charts here and really as Keith said, I just want to sync what he's saying macro wise where I'm coming up micro wise. We usually are around the same area. The key ballpark is, is, is as far as where we end up with stock ideas. I have some I think which might be a little different. Um, and I want to explain why. So the first thing I want to hit on here is this chart, which I call my Sigma analysis. Now, this is going to look a lot like something you see out of Keith and his team, which Darius worked really hard on. Um, so I think we copied a little bit of each other's stuff and we got to quadrants. Some, some, Those are quadrants, some right? Sauce. We got, so look, on the, on the vertical axis here, this is really important. This is your sales to inventory spread. So, yo. Know, you always want to be as high as possible here. It's the sales growth minus your inventory growth. Let's just say sales are growing plus 10, inventories are growing plus four, you're going to show up at a positive six. And I guess here it's a positive four, it's as high as it's been over the course of two years. So the point is, sales inventory spread is really, really positive. On the horizontal axis, let's just flip back and show that chart one more time you see the year-over-year -year change in margin. So what you want to be is on the right-hand side of that chart and not on the left-hand side of that chart. My sweet spot is in that upper right-hand corner. That's where sales are better than inventories, margins are up, life is great, these guys are selling everything and they're selling a lot of it and it's at a great margin. What's very unusual is being in quad one, as I'll call it, cleanup mode. It's where you're cleaning your balance sheet and it's where you're getting ready for some big move. Usually you're in that quadrant for two quarters tops. We've been in there for five. Ah, so I view wow. that as almost like a bow and arrow. This thing is cocked. It's just being pulled back further and further and further. And it's getting ready to just go somewhere and go somewhere really, really fast. I marry that with quad four on your guys side and I come up with it going down. And if you go down to your quad four and our quad four, <laughs> And you mean it can't go up the beyond thing. the top right corner of the chart? No, I can't do that. And I'm not resetting the axis either. <laughs> so I'm, 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 I'm not overly worried about sales. I just want to put it like clear there because I think sales expectations are kind of okay. Yes. Um, You're talking I'm, about retail sales. I'm talking about retail sales yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. on a bottom up basis mm -hmm. for the Targets and the Walmarts and the Coles and all those guys. Mm -hmm. um, I am very worried about margins for a couple of reasons I'll hit on, and I'm worried about inventories, which flows back and turns yeah. into a margin problem. So mm -hmm. um, I want to hit on sales expectations first, and this is on the following slide. So what you see, and this is why I'm not overly worried on the left-hand side there, I know the chart's a little messy, but you see your black line, which is what sales growth have been, has been, have been, on a bottom-up basis over the course of the past, what, six or eight quarters, mm -hmm. and they've looked stellar. Now expectations do have them coming down over the course of one quarter. The, it comes the, down fast. It comes down mm -hmm. fast, yeah. So I look at it and I'm like, okay, I think the sell side maybe has got it okay. They got it in, in, in their numbers overall. The dots, however, show the two-year trend. So the two-year trend, yeah, looks okay, but then obviously expectations are things are just getting better. Mm -hmm. On the right-hand side, this goes from um, you know a, a, a trend duration over to a tail duration, and it shows you that the street is looking at sales expectations just pretty much going up in perpetuity. Yeah, so for those of you that don't know the difference between a trend and a tail, uh, at Hedgeye, a trend is three months or more, so quarterly data, which Brian had on the left side of the chart and on the right side of the chart, correct me if I'm wrong, but tail, which is three years or less, it's annual uh, expectation. So exactly. not surprisingly, after nine quarters in a row, what you're saying is nine quarters in a row of U.S. growth accelerating, which has never happened before. Yep. Retail sales have accelerated for five of those last five in a row, the last quarters, and Wall Street's modeling that out as continuing as far as the eye can see. Because that's what they do. Yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. All right. That's good that they do that. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you're on another channel, 
uh, where you'll now have to stop for a commercial. Uh, <laughs> you, 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 will, you will note that it's just a bunch of head bobbing and talking about what happened yesterday as opposed to having accurate forecasts in the future. So right. um, thanks for that. That's a very yeah. different uh, view that you yeah. have. Well, one thing I want to show, and this next slide is key. Park on this thing for like a solid two or three minutes. Mm -hmm. So there's, <laughs> are gonna there's, there's a lot going on here, and stick with me. What it shows is back, you know, over the past nine years on a monthly basis, the monthly retail sales dollars, the incremental, like year-on-year -year change in retail sales dollars for brick and mortar versus e-com. You see that dark line in, in the background, that's your e-com sales. It's going, it's secular up and to the right. Right, and, and what, what do you guys think e-com sales grow? 30? Actually grow mid-teens. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's a lot less than most people think. Mm -hmm. In the worst environment going, it'll grow at 11, 12, or 13. In the best environment going, it'll grow at 19 or 20. Mm -hmm. So it's actually locked in between a band there. That's our, it's, behavior very, very repetitious, just over and over again. The impulse purchase, and this is back on this chart here, like when we have a lot of extra money in our pocket, we actually go to a store. And on this chart, what really, really bothers me. Yep, yeah, yeah. So you see the, the blue line, and you see what's happened over the past 12 months. The mall visit has shot right up. Booyah. And it's actually gone, as far as incremental dollars, past what e-com has done. So we have to see, remember last year, of course you guys do, because you do macro, when we had 6.9% um, yeah, comp in, uh, hol oh, yeah. in holiday of last year, it was just mm -hmm. monstrous. In order for us to not see a big rollover in that trend and have the accrual come away from brick and mortar, we have to see that happen again. Against yes. the, the, again. It's got to happen again. This isn't miracle. Again. No. <laughs> it's no, not right. going to happen. No. So this is like a really key uh, chart. This is like, will brick and mortar ever comp again? It might not ever comp again, like ever. Um, it's just <laughs> something to throw out there, but it's very, very bearish. Right yeah, after, Brian, almost every hedge fund that's had performance issues this year, um, you know, you can call it whatever, you can call EPI, you know, it's some kind of performance issue dysfunction. You know, the reality is that a lot of hedge fund managers got fired for missing this move. Yeah. You know, because they couldn't believe that brick and mortar crap retail, as I affectionately call yeah. it, yeah. actually could come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But from here, now that people have lost their jobs, been squeezed and covered their shorts, what if they just don't come? That's right. That's the point, right? right? Well, one of the interesting things, and I'll hit on this in a minute as far as inventories go, is that the retailers are budgeting for a 3% comp. So you gotta think about that. This product is made, it's on the water, it's getting ready to be put on a truck cool. and brought over to a store. So it's showing up and it's getting sold. The question is, what does it get sold uh -huh. at? Which brings me over to margins. margins. And that's this next chart here, which kind of blows me away. So, okay, <laughs> next, next quarter is in check, I get it. I'm not overly worried about what we see in November. I'm worried about the guide that we see when all these numbers start coming out in late November. Of course, the street is looking for margin expectations just to go through the moon. Um, I have a slide next, don't flip there yet, but it just shows labor. I mean, like store store labor is absolutely crazy. So you have the, the, the retail, wage inflation. yeah, retail wage inflation is ex is is exceeding core U.S. wage inflation mm -hmm. oh, um, by a country mile. So that's a big problem. Go back to that slide again because I got to point you to the right hand side of that one. These are consensus margin expectations on the right hand side. So we were just talking quarterly, and they're very aggressive. Now let's talk annual again. We're going from trend over to tail. We saw, I'm going to count here, excuse me, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years in a row of margins going down or the rate of change getting worse in one of the best macro environments that we've seen in God knows how long. And now we're late cycle, we're going towards quad four, and now the street's looking for margins in 18, 19, and 20 going up. Straight up. <laughs> so at the same time they should be de banking business, brother. The, the, exactly. the same That's time they should be decelerating on the downside yeah. is when expectations have them accelerating on the upside. And mm -hmm. I just have an inherent problem with that. You can't be intellectually honest and actually build a model and go through every part of your cost model and get to cost deflation. It just won't happen. No. Totally. But you could get the next banking deal. You could get the yeah, you could get them. <laughs> just gotta show them a nice upwardly sloping chart. And there'll be a lot totally. of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, next slide, tariffs. Oh, um, boy. This is actually yeah a slide after this. Where's Trump? So, 
this is really noisy. The dotted line shows you the change in retail gross margin. The green line or the green area and the red area is the difference in the per unit cost. So essentially, you can have per unit costs which are coming down, mm -hmm. which you have had at points, but you've had the per unit price that's come down even more, yes. which is accrued to the benefit of retailers. Yep. So you always have to look at one relative to the other one. Mm -hmm. That's a right? good chart. Um, yeah. And what I'm forecasting there is modest tariffs. This is assuming we have our 200 billion at 25%, and that's what's in that model right now. There's almost no mathematical way gross margins could be up for retailers next year unless we pony up and we pay for the extra tariffs. And there's a couple of great stock plays on that. I think Dollar Tree is money, mm -hmm. um, just because of a big change you can see in its pricing policy mm -hmm. around that. So I really want to talk about that. But this is um, a key chart. No one else does it. Why? I don't know. Oh, because it's hard. The buy side does it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they probably do. Old Wall Media, the analysts they interview, no. Nope. Yep. <laughs> I do it. <laughs> 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 That's why, oh, yeah. That's why people pay the big bucks. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right, earnings, next chart. So all that, we got sales, we have margins, and now we have earnings. Um, let's go and look at trend versus tail once again. So you have here, again, we have a dip on the uh, two-year run rate in the upcoming quarter, i.e. current, current quarter uh, earnings look fine. It's your quarters after that where we're accelerating to a mid-teens earnings growth rate which will have surpassed anything we'll have seen over the past four years at a time when we're going to have an inventory problem and we're going to have a quad four margin problem. Oh, yeah. So how these do, things just don't you, add up. How do, you, how do you guide to an acceleration there with the dollar up, with wages up, with potentially peaking retail sales? I mean, easy. You, you, you just draw a line. You hand the analysis. Just draw a line. <laughs> No, seriously, how does someone build a model with those interests? You, you have your junior associate do the model and you yeah. bless it. That's, a, you know, that's how you get there. Yeah, yeah. But look at this, though. On the right-hand side... Just like side, how you find a gold mine, you just keep digging. <laughs> just walk outside. <laughs> right, Right-hand side of this is tail. So earnings growth for retail specifically, three years in a row, have grown at less than 1%. Wow. And now, when we're going where we are, earnings all of a sudden are going to grow in the, let's call it the high single digits. I'll, give them a gimme on that mid-teens number there because um, it's 18 and we've already banked a part of that. But how does that happen? I, I, just, I just don't understand. So look, it's, I'm not being a cynic just for the sake of being cynical. I'm just doing bottom-up math. I'm looking at where the consensus numbers are. I'm looking at where reality is from a consumer standpoint, a macro standpoint, and they simply do not match up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a valuation slide on here, but I'm telling you, valuations don't match up either. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of great short, a lot of great shorts here, a lot of great longs. I got them on this next slide here, um, and we could hit on them. If there are any questions on any of these things, please knock yourself out. Um, but. Uh, there's a lot of ways I think we can make money on this. Yeah, so for those of you that are looking at that, those are all the names that Brian McGough and his team, his four-person research team, uh, follows actively and has conviction in, either on the long or the short side, the longs being, of course, green, and the shorts being red. I came up with that myself. Uh, ultimately, there's a lot to think about, though, especially when you think about like what we talked about from a short-selling perspective with Andrew Leff, uh, and we talked about with Chris Whalen in terms of the cycle. So if we are indeed at peak cycle, mm -hmm. Brian, your group might be one of the best groups uh, happy hunting on the short side, and a lot of these crap retailers have had huge moves. Yeah, so if you were to take that group, um, and you're just to pick your, you know, this is kind of a leading question because I, th I think I know the answer, but nobody else does until you answer it. Uh, what is your favorite crap retail short with market cap? <laughs> it's Colts. Yep. You knew that. Well, there's some alliteration I thought you were going for. I might have been going to Haynes Brands, <laughs> but, but, but care about the crap? No, um, so Coles, great short. 550 in earnings power right now. Buck 70 comes from credit. A buck, uh, $2.25 comes from egregious lease accounting, and a buck, a buck 25 comes from a subprime customer. You add all those up, and you get to 520 in fake earnings. And the street thinks it'll do seven bucks a share in a couple of years. They've gotten seven now. Oh yeah, the street's seven bucks. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Now yeah. on that number, it's cheap, bro. It's, yeah. yeah it, it's sure. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's, that's, <laughs> That's the other thing I want to make sure that all of you, and again, thanks for joining us. I mean, those of you who haven't worked in the hedge fund industry and shorted stocks, uh, what you want to find are fake estimates. So you want to find people that have a forward outlook that reflects what happened in the rear view, which Brian just laid out, mm -hmm. which is an acceleration, and just extrapolating the acceleration 
effectively as far out in the future as the eye can see. That's right. That's called a sell sides model, or that's called an investment banker's model, or it's called somebody who's on TV who's perpetuating one of those two things, or both. So at the end of the day, you want to be very careful of that. And the big opportunity for short sellers is when your number on a forward outlook is going down and theirs is going up. So that's effectively what you're saying. Right. So the street is saying, hey, these things are cheap trading at 12 times earnings. Right. I'm saying, no, they're expensive. They're at 18 times earnings. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and that's and, where we are with calls. But this whole, like, uh, this whole thing that people, and I feel bad for people, some people that are watching this for the first time because they've been this whole old wall way. You know, you can't listen to uh, these channels without hearing oh, but if you look at it on valuation, and they'll just like look it up on Yahoo Finance, see the multiple and call it cheap if the multiple's low, they'll call it expensive if the multiple's high. That means nothing, okay? That means absolutely nothing. My fourth grader can tell you exactly whether or not on those parameters a stock is cheap or expensive. What my fourth grader can't do, or a 12th grader, or somebody who's even been in the business competing with you for a decade, never mind the you know, two plus decades that you've been doing this, is they can't tell you whether it's cheap or expensive based on the right number. Okay, the right number is super important here. So who's got the biggest delta on downside numbers relative to uh, your forecast? Is it Kohl's that has the most downside? Kohl's has the most downside. Carter's comes close. Carter's, oh, that's Carter's, an awful Carter's looking is, chart. Yeah, it's an interesting oh, one right CRI. now. CRI, yeah. cry yep. for me. Yeah, go for <laughs> cool. Carter's, Carter's. Been there many times. I have four kids. We can come up with qualitative reasons on why we like the company. Blah, 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 blah. Every new dad I talk to, oh no, it's a great brand. I got it. It's okay. a great brand. It's yeah. a crappy stock. So there's just a big difference. So <laughs> Carter's the first, fir yeah. first time, nope. the first time in 18. <laughs> no? No, I'm not. <laughs> not, yet. not that you're aware of. Uh, um, so in 18, it's going to have a flat year. Um, um, scratch that, I'm wrong. In 18, it's going to have earnings up in the high single digits, and then it's going into a flat year in 19. We're going to realize that in the fourth quarter earnings numbers, which is going to be a disaster, this thing trades now. It's come down. It's been working, but it's still trading at a 15, 16 multiple. This is feast or famine. Trades at a 20 multiple when it's actually growing. Trades at a 12 multiple when it's not growing or oh it's flat. And there's a $75 stock, and right now it's 98 bucks. And it mm -hmm. looks horrible from a, you ride on it every other day. You probably ride I, on I, it. I, I just you, shorted that. You ride on it more again, than me. Real time I know you Boink, boink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Carter's big, big downside there. There's, I mean, my daughters wear Peppa Pig shirts from that place, but it doesn't matter. It's still yeah. an oinker. Yeah. And that looks terrible. Yeah. Uh, before we take questions, um, long side, you mentioned Dollar Tree. What's yeah. the deal there? Dollar Tree, um, there's a lot going on at Dollar Tree. This is a story of two securities. It owns Dollar Tree, which is a core concept where our wives might shop. Yep. It's like a treasure hunter type thing. Everything is a buck. You go in there and you can buy you can buy like a wrench for a buck. You go to Home Depot, it's five bucks. They find these great values yep. and great closeouts. Batteries. And it's a good concept. Pampers. Problem is it's the biggest exposed to tariffs. Totally. So they everything in that store is at a buck. You, but there is a clear example, a company called Dollarama, who had the same concept and they broke the buck price point. You have an end cap and you say, hey, here's uh, an iPhone charger with great value at 350. It's still an amazing value at that price point. Um, they're going to have to break this buck price point. Once they do, you have about 60 bucks in optionality on the stock off uh, an $85 stock. Because they're just selling things for more than a buck. Right. Which is perfectly okay. They're not going to fire their customer, and it'll be well received. Well, the customer will pay more than a buck. Oh, yeah. But the stuff's There's, not in there for more than a buck. No, it's not. So milk, like stuff like that? Uh, there are certain things they can't sell. You can't buy a diaper at a Dollar Tree. Mm. So you can't buy formula. You can't buy electronics. You can't buy a football. Hmm. So it just gives them a lot of optionality to go into a lot of new categories. Big, big idea. You've got the CEO who's out there telling shareholders, no, we can't, we don't have to do that. We don't have to do that. And then a couple of weeks ago, he testifies in front of Trump saying, if tariffs go through, it'll be a disaster for our business model. Like you're telling one side one thing, another side another thing. The punchline on this whole story is there are many ways you can win. One, breaking the, the buck price point. It will take an activist, I think, in order to get that done. Then four years ago, it bought Family Dollar, which is a piece of crap. It's like crap tail, mm -hmm. right? So um, it had that, and it hasn't done anything. You have the what has been the best management team in retail at Dollar Tree. It's moved one individual over to Family Dollar over that time period. It simply hasn't moved what? fast. It hasn't leveraged any executives. Um, the store managers, you've got 9,000 openings for store managers uh, for a company that has an 8,000 411 store base. 
they have a problem with employment. They aren't paying enough. They're not merchandising stores appropriately. Wow. I have a full deck. I have a full activist deck, which walks through all the ways you can fix. Fix it. Right. So, if you do either of those things, you get 250 in earnings power incremental on top of a 650 earnings annuity. So, if both of those things happen, this is a $200 stock. 200. And, and it's 80 now. And if it does nothing. Then you're looking at 550, 575 in earnings on a 12 multiple. It gets you what, like a $68 stock. Hmm. I'm not saying that I wouldn't be incredibly pissed off if I saw a $68 stock over 85, but this is one of those opportunities. There's you can't find something like this in public markets right now, and that's why when, something that's with market cap. Yeah. yeah, it's got cap, and we did a deck on this thing here. Um, as far as how these decks go, we are in our studio here and we get all energized and we do our deck and we go through our 80 pages of why something's a great idea or a bad idea. The number of activists that we had clued in on that call was off the charts. Yeah. So uh, tier, tier one activists are sniffing around here and I'm not banking on another guy going out there and doing the work. I got to do the work. That's my job. Mm -hmm. I'll point it out and let's see if someone follows. I'd be very surprised if we didn't see anyone follow. And what's funny on this one is that investors are like, yeah, I got to be patient. If I see an activist step in, even if it's up 10% that day, I'll go and I'll buy it. Well, guess what? If everyone thinks that on the day an activist goes in, it's going to be up 20%. Yeah, come on, guys. Yeah, totally. Guys, 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 guys. Two and 20, you don't get paid to wait like that. Yeah, strap it on. Somebody go for it. <laughs> yeah, at the end of the, no, I mean, seriously. I mean, this is the hedge fund business. You got to get, you got to step up. Come on. These good ideas are hard to find. Um, anyway, even I can understand this idea, which makes it pretty simple. Um, so this is, uh, this, and, and the other thing I like about it, and it's a good risk management idea, uh, when you're on the back side of the cycle. So to come full circle on this, I'm not going to short a stock that's already imploded. And I'd like to buy stocks that have already imploded. Okay, because my downside, just quantitatively, is less after it's gone straight down. And this, in this case of Dollar Tree, yeah. um, I'm, I'd be looking at buying a stock. And again, I'd use the risk range to buy it appropriately. Yeah. But I'd be accumulating the stock on days that it's at the low end of the range. And I'd be shorting the living daylights out of the Coles and Carters when they're at the top end of the range. That's how you should do 2 and 20 work. Uh, if you want to get paid. Uh, anyway, that's my rant about that. Let's take a couple questions and then we're going to have um, Todd Jordan in it, at, at, in, I think in five minutes. Yep, absolutely. Let's, let's start with the top down and we'll be quick here. I'll start with the top down and then sort of finish with a couple more bottom yep. up ideas. Uh, where do we stand on your retail apocalypse now thesis? Apocalypse now. Apocalypse. apocalypse now, we're there. I mean, there, there, there are these factors, <laughs> factors building up that one slot I showed, the incremental dollars. Yes. You know, where, I, I drew a line. I said, this is when we're at a point where we have to see a meaningful ramp and we have to see a seven comp again in order to have this trend not roll over. We're right there. Apocalypse is now. Quad four in Q4. I can't say that enough times. Quad four. Growth and inflation ex that it goes from accelerating to decelerating. At the same time, quad four in Q4. And Brian's got the same view from a bottom-up perspective in a second. Yeah, totally. So we have uh, three slides in our macro deck. Maybe you can sell to you and you can license for your retail. <laughs> uh, the one, one is I'm not on paying you a royalty. No, nah, it's all good. Um, the first slide is on slide 29 where we show uh, the, the growth rate of retail sales control group. Um, and, and we run a scenario analysis on projecting that forward using the, the two-year average sequential momentum for each successive month. Um, and what you learn is that retail sales will peak. If you, if you did the exact same thing your Apocalypse Now chart just says, again, the year-over-year -year rate of change is going to decelerate. So their call is that we're not going to do that again. That was obviously an anomalous event that's yep. unlikely to happen. Um, the second slide is that wage growth does not equal inflation, certainly in the short to intermediate term. And the chart that's probably most sort of bearish for you know a lot of these crap retailers um, is a slide I snuck in the in the back of the deck um, in the appendix. We we're in California last week. Was that accelerating wage growth does not translate into accelerating retail sales? Historically, that's actually a slightly negative relationship on a training basis. You typically see wage or retail sales growth peak ahead of wage growth um, across many cycles. This is going back data going back 30 years. Um, my take on that is that consumers shop, you know, in, in an aspirational manner rather than yep. you know from an income-based manner. But I'm sure there's plenty of other theories. But well, and you have wages up and often hours down. Hours down, exactly. Because these guys are managing so to a wage growth number. is actually decelerating. Yeah. Um, so that, that tends to be. So those three things are obviously not. Uh, very positive on the long side of crap retail from here. Crap retail? Yeah. <laughs> Today in Irish, it's crap. <laughs> totally. Coles, it's Coles, it's crap. Exactly. All right, so two companies they, are... They hate us. Yeah. Those Coles guys. Oh, yeah. Coles. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? If you go to Coles, you'll hate it. 
I've never been Next to a Kohl's. I'm in my <laughs> early, early to mid 30s. You're right? not the customer. I've never been to a Kohl's. Probably never will. Oh. Um, uh, Walmart versus Amazon. Uh, which stock would you pick in the long term? Um, which one would? All right. So this. So Amazon. Um, I will say this though. Here's here's like a talking out of the other side of my mouth point on that one. Mm -hmm. Amazon needs stores. It. it a lot of people don't realize how and what's going on, but it is building its own stores. These new DCs, it builds a million square foot DC. Mm -hmm. That DC could actually become its own mall, yeah. like a million square foot mall Jeez. that comes up out of nowhere. So <laughs> this is a big theme out there. So Walmart, um, I'm sorry, Amazon needs stores. Why did it buy Whole Foods? Because it needs stores. Why will it probably buy Dick's Sporting Goods? Why should it buy uh, Best Buy? It needs stores and it needs them in the secondary and tertiary markets. Mm -hmm. but, but I've got Walmart on the other end where it needs e-com. Am I going to trust Walmart more to build up a successful e-com business or for Amazon to build a store business? I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I know the answer to that question. I mean, Walmart's been investing a lot of capital. I'll bet against a lot of management teams in retail. Um, that's one. I won't bet against them. Mm -hmm. I mean, these guys are no dummies, and they've hired a lot of great people, incentivized them in a lot of the right ways. But, I mean, let's face facts. Amazon is Amazon. Um, we try to make our mark instead of, you know, saying, ah, it should trade at like a thousand times in earnings number we'll never see. And I don't want to pick that magic multiple and, and have a like yeah. $20,000 know price the, the, target. The, 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 I want to make money on the ecosystem. That, that whole argument, though, the magic multiple, what is Amazon worth, lived in an environment of nine straight quarters of U.S. growth accelerating and retail sales growth accelerating to a cycle peak. So you can get as creative as you want, and that's that's how these bubble multiples were built. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not saying Amazon's a good or bad company. God forbid, I actually said it was a bad company. I don't have any business saying that. I'm just saying that when it slows, when you're in quad four, you buy Walmart and you short Amazon. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's what you do. And in, in the second quarter of next year, when we're no longer in quad four, you buy Amazon and you short Walmart. Like that way, you don't have to have this passionate belief that these stocks that you love are like your spouse. I mean, right. you love your spouse. I love my spouse. Theirs wants a spouse. You know, everybody's got great spouses. <laughs> but I don't want to. I don't want to love a stock like that. I just don't. I mean, and and you can fall in love when something doesn't change for a long period of time, and that was growth. Yeah. So um, anyway, we could talk to you forever, but now we got Todd Jordan knocking on yeah. the door. So. Uh, where is? Oh, there. Uh, uh, so appreciate it, Brian. That Jordan's was awesome. the bane of my existence. If you still have questions uh, for Brian, thank you. Um, just keep firing away, and he's on Twitter, and uh, he's he's pretty uh, he's he's pretty much there pretty answering pretty questions. Vocal. Okay. Awesome. All right, Brian. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. That was awesome. And now here's um, so right. so Todd Jordan. For those of you that don't know, uh, now you're going to get to know. Well, this handsome guy at uh, Hedge Eyes. Yeah. Second yeah, most. Not quite. Darius is now going to oh, yeah. now gonna try to sell Todd Jordan some macro research. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty expensive. <laughs> You'll note that our team like likes to compete with each other, um, <laughs> and all three of us uh, are partners at the firm, and Brian yeah. is too. So I mean. It's been, it's been fun to build, but this is actually an, quite an interesting time, obviously with China slowing, uh, Todd's group is gaming, lodging, leisure, he covers all of uh, Macau, those are the kind of the stocks that you probably talk about, maybe not the most, but a lot of people care about. Yeah, and, big uh, market cap, yeah. they move like crazy, so yeah. a lot of volume, Yeah, a lot of volatility. But you had actually, the biggest audience you've had uh, in months was actually about your, your most recent kind of immediate term view versus your intermediate term view on Vegas. Yeah, um, oh, which differs. Quite Which, a bit. Yeah, and that's that's new, and and there was a ton of uh, when I say ton of interest, I'm talking about institutional money managers, uh, whether it be pension funds, mutual funds, long short hedge funds, that really you know we can see who's dialing in, we can see who's engaged. This was the biggest audience we had. It surprised me, probably didn't surprise you. Yeah, well, I knew it was kind of a battleground anyways, and it's it's a battleground on either you're you know positive on the strip or you're negative on the strip, but also there's two major strip operators, Caesars and and MGM. Yeah. And I would say, you know, I, from just months before we did this deck, that Caesar seemed to be the one that was owned by a lot of hedge funds. Mm -hmm. So I was getting pushed. You could just tell by what, you know, people are pitching their questions, right? And just, <laughs> really? You know, boom. <laughs> people do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Haven't you ever been at a hedge fund? Uh, I don't know. I, uh, I thought I'd call you yeah. and push something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, it was like Caesar, Caesar, Caesar. Whereas if I go back, you know, 12 months, nine months, it was MGM. And we didn't like MGM back then, right? Mm -hmm. And so you could just kind of see where the, the money was positioned. So I knew when I came out with this deck, I mean, the most of the calls would be, you know, why didn't you come out long on Caesars? And we actually said, you know, the near term is going to actually be good for, for both MGM and Caesars. Yeah. But we just favor the companies that got more exposure to the strip because we like the strip for a very short 
period of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, we still have the same issues we pointed out in the first part of the year, uh, with you know, prices are just too damn high. Is what it comes down to. And if you don't have the convention business to offset that, which they didn't, it was going to be a problem this year, and it turned out to be a problem. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't change our opinion over the near term. And now, like with all the hedge funds out of M uh, MGM, sentiment's just awful. And we have a catalyst of, look, the fourth quarter is going to be on the margin sequentially better. Because it and couldn't actually, have been worse. Yeah, and you can yeah. see, so there's a big investor conference going out yeah. in Vegas right now. It's called G2E, and, and yep. I was out in Vegas last week trying to preempt it, which he used to do that. You would me. never do something. Yeah. <laughs> Keith and I actually, we, we went out there a few times together oh, in yeah. Vegas the week before G2E. So the old oh, yeah. wall goes, just so that, you know, again, we're trying to get you on the ins, this is the whole yeah. thing of hedge eye. You know, we built a hedge fund that people could look inside of, but we don't run money because it would be conflict of interest, blah, 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 blah. But we actually know what we're doing so what we do is we go to the place that all of Wall Street's gonna go a week ahead of time mm -hmm. and then they'd report to you what they, we already had reported to us a week ago and then the old wall puts them on TV next week yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's like stealing candy you know it's just, <laughs> it's just so easy uh, and but but what you know what you learn is okay well you know, business is, is not too bad yeah. and if you look at the stocks today Las Vegas strip business yeah, yeah strip just business. Las Vegas strip but because People overreact. So Q3, like, I'm not saying Vegas is a problem. We just knew Q3 was going to be an issue. The company should have seen it coming. Mm. And they actually had the power to change their mix shift. Like, the, you know, when you're, when you're a casino hotel, you've got different businesses. You've got the FIT, the free and independent traveler, mm -hmm. right? So that would be just like, I mean, us three, we're yeah. going, let's go, go to, to Vegas. Vegas. You know, we book kind of late. Yeah. You know, we pay kind of a high rate and we gamble and we spend money everywhere else. And we're just the most profitable customer. The problem is if... We, for some reason, don't want to go because prices are too damn high. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to fill. Mm -hmm. Now, if you know ahead of time that prices are too damn high and the leisure customer may not be there, you put more group business in, yes. which you get you know, maybe a higher rate or higher occupancy, but they don't spend money in the casino. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. So there's always a trade-off, but you have some pr um, ability to, to make shift your rooms. Or Caesars, for instance, can comp more of their rooms to their loyalty yes. customers. right? So we're heading into that quarter, third quarter, looked bad. Uh, it ended up being bad. But it's not like it's the end of the world, right? you know? And so people, of course, like they always do, and we always used to, uh, when we were on the buy side, always taking advantage of the overreaction, and people overreacted on Q3, and now we got Q4. It just needs to be sequentially better, you mm -hmm. know? And, and it looks like it's gonna be sequentially better. Yeah. And the catalyst was everybody and their brother is gonna be out there for G2E, and that's today. And stocks are up, MGM's up 4%, 3%, Caesar's up 3 and 4%. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? Yeah, it is. You know? And again, this is this is not rocket science in terms of understanding the rates of change of the model, but it does get a little confusing for people when you talk across duration. Yeah. So you go from, okay, intermediate term, you guys are just hosing your customers. It's too expensive to go to Vegas, or you're not letting them win enough. You're not comping right. enough rooms. To, okay, stocks get hammered. Now, actually, it's not that bad. So you go from, from not that bad to actually good. Right. But then in the next six months, what's going to happen yeah. to Vegas? Yeah, well, that's we're negative. So we did this right <laughs> <up. laughs> That's yeah. what you know. And you might say, "Oh, you're getting too cute and too nuanced," but you know, when you have Not stocks really. that are so volatile, like totally. you, you can't you can't just just punt on like uh, near term six catalysts. months. A long I could time. be you know, especially if it's Macau. You can be you can be have a, a negative call on Macau, but you think the near term is positive and the stocks are up thirty percent in your face. Like, yeah. do you really want to short that? <laughs> Why don't you just go long? And, anyway, yeah. you're not always going to be right because you can get too cute, but. The fact of the matter is, you're right. I mean, there, you know, if I look at duration, and we, you know, we have people across the duration spectrum, right? Totally. We have yeah. traders, especially my space, we have traders, and we do long-term decks, like we did Las Vegas Strip. We had a long-term call, but we also had within that a uh, shorter-term call. And the longer-term call is the market's got to grow into this pricing stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's 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 interesting as like a consumer because you can see it. I don't know, you know, I'm sure many of our our, our audience here has been to Vegas. And have you noticed how expensive it is? The only deal, the only deal in Vegas is your published room rate, yes. right? So you see that it's a like 200 bucks. I get this big room. That's great. Oh wait, you got a $60 resort fee on top of that, mm -hmm. which is not in that published rate. Mm -hmm. um, I get there, and remember, remember the good old days when you used to play blackjack and it paid three to two on a blackjack hit? Mm -hmm. That was awesome. It pays six to five now in Vegas. That's terrible. Wow. That's noticeable. Yeah, it's a big difference. And I'll give you, so I was in uh, MGM Springfield, just opened up. Um, MGM is the biggest strip operator, mm -hmm. uh, but also opened a property in Springfield, Massachusetts. Gotcha. And I go there uh, with my wife on a Saturday because it's close to, to our house and, and we decide to go there and I can check it out and also you know take her to dinner and have a good time. Sit down and play blackjack, six to five odds, 
everybody's pissed at the table. <laughs> because <laughs> Foxwoods and Mohegan, the closest competitor, are right. still three to two. Yeah, but totally. Vegas is six to five. So that's changing the odds. That's changing the pricing that's make, making yeah. it more expensive. Yeah. Keith McCullough, I think you should go to Vegas. We'll go together. We'll go to a night's game with, uh, with the president of our company. <laughs> and we're going to go to one of these steakhouses with the extensive wine because you know wine better. I mean, I know. This I can sounds pick good up. so far. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> can I come? Well, not, you know, it gets, it gets bad when I tell you about the prices. <laughs> <laughs> if it was B -O BYOB, we'd be fine. Yeah. So we'll go, and you're going to look across. You find the wines that you recognize and look at the markups. Mm. Oh, yeah. And look, I know I probably, if it's a, a wine list of 100, you know, I probably know five to ten. Keith probably knows multiples of that. But it's it's fascinating because I know what the typical markup yeah. is. And their markup's like five times. It's yeah. ridiculous. Wow. It's everything. And a steak is so it's more expensive than New York. You know? But you think you're getting a deal because um, you know you're getting that good rate on the room and it's a big room. However, people are coming around to this, right? And oh, man. you go on TripAdvisor. This was the first thing that triggered it for us. You go on TripAdvisor and everybody's complaining about Price. Uh, price. price. Yeah, totally. So, and you can see the leisure. Now you're seeing it in the leisure. There's also market. wine fraud. I mean, for, pe for people that know wine, they're playing vintage fraud. Yeah, they do that at the liquor store. So they're basically, like, if you look at a California Cabernet, Napa Valley. So everybody knows, I think everybody knows what those are. You go to a steakhouse, that's probably what you're looking for. Okay? 2012, 2013, 2015. Those are three great vintages. So just take the 2014s and price them at the same that you would the other ones, right. but say that you have 12, 2012, 2013. So you're saying it's on the menu, mm -hmm. yes. when you order and it comes in at 2014. It is, mm -hmm. it is, is deceitful, it's is. wrong, it's, I think it's insulting, and I call every single, you know, every single, it's kind of, it gets uncomfortable, especially if you're, imagine you're dating somebody and you have to call them out on it. Yeah. But I'm, yeah. you know, but you know it's actually for the greater good to do that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because most people are getting screwed. Well, the, even the poor guy who's serving it up, doesn't, doesn't realize that. it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, anyway, I digress. But it's no, it's, 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 it's a problem that restaurants, your your world, whether it be casinos um, or if you just even like push that further into restaurants and hotels, you know, they're trying to get that little bit extra out of everyone yeah. all at the same time. Yeah, and they just they've gone too far. And, yes. And I got I've got the um, some of the companies to actually admit that. So the visitation has to grow in and. and um, Josephine, I don't know if you can put on that slide on that shows uh, the Las Vegas slide, but you can see the big diversions between uh, attendance or visitation of Vegas, and it goes down, mm -hmm. and pricing, and we, we and you see the chart on the right, look at the divergence. So you're starting to see visitation to Vegas decline, that's the blue line on the right, mm -hmm. and the black line is um, oh our God. pricing index, which includes all of the stealth pricing. Ticket shows, right, so yeah. ticket shows. Ticket prices are straight up and to the right. Attendance is straight down. So yeah. um, all that factored in, you're seeing lower visitation. And, and you know, granted, we did have the, the, the shooting, the, the, the tragedy last October. But even before that happened, you were seeing visitation go down. That's in, in the like the biggest like leisure spend environment yeah. we've seen in a long time. Like all totally. the other leisure sectors are doing great. Theme parks. I mean, just look at yeah. um, for the hotels. You we bifurcate between. Uh, the, the weekend rate versus the weekday rate, mm -hmm. and the weekend rate is mostly leisure, and yeah. that's been up outperforming yeah. for for years. Yeah, yeah, babe. Yeah, so look, even if you don't make money on the long or short ideas from Todd Jordan, which is unlikely, um, <laughs> go next time you go to Vegas, just ask for your room to, come, to be comped or threaten to go to the next door. I mean, yeah. they know that they're ripping you off. Yeah. You didn't know until you knew, which is now. So at a bare minimum, that's what you know. Yeah, yeah um, totally. What, uh, before we get into the queue, I do have a quick sure. question. What what's allowed? Vegas to take price to this degree? Um, has it been just sort of the, the equity market? What drives pricing, the pricing models of these uh, players? Well, on the good side, we haven't had a lot of new supply mm -hmm. come online because basically the cost of entry is yep. going up tra dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's helped. Um, so no, with no new room supply, no new casino supply, they've been able to take price. Mm -hmm. um, and then they found out that they could do this in a stealth way, right? Um, even parking and Mm -hmm. uh, like the menu prices, uh, changing the odds on both the slots and the tables, craps, everything. Yeah. But what they didn't envision was at some point people are going to really figure this out. Mm -hmm. And we used TripAdvisor as kind of a gauge of when they started to figure it out. And it was middle of last year, and that's when you started to see, wow, why isn't Vegas visitation going up? That's the answer. Mm -hmm. so. um, and actually, before questions, maybe a quick roundup on Macau. Yeah, Macau, uh, it's just, you know, the glass is half empty. I mean, you guys have had a great uh, call on, on China slowing. And, and, you know, the way I look at Macau is 
uh, you know, GDP matters, mm -hmm. but the penetration rate, and we've got a slide on this too, which just shows you like the penetration rate is so low across mainland China, mm -hmm. right? So you're not as relying on economic growth. So you can see, um, oh, yeah. look at the casino pen gaming penetration yeah, in the yeah. United States versus Australia versus China. And China <laughs> has culturally the, the most propensity to, to gamble. To gamble, yes. You know? right. And I can back that up because Felix Wong works for me and he's Chinese. <laughs> um, his parents are uh, born and raised in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's the difference. So like if, if, if I see GDP slowing from seven to 4%, yeah, that's not great for Macau, but I still got this penetration. And the good news is they're starting to penetrate um, the outer provinces now, mm, which gosh. now you're going to see that overall penetration rate go up. And they're turning out to be great customers. The biggest stat, like the, if Vegas could even have close to this, I would be so bullish on Vegas. The percentage of visitors that are first-time visitors in Macau is 50%. Wow. Which is astonishing for long-term growth. Now, that would normally spark huge interest from long onlys. Right, so if we go back to that 2010 to 2014 bull cycle, yeah. mm -hmm. you had two 30% drawdowns during that period. Um, in, the, in the stocks. In, in the, the stocks, stocks. Yeah. yeah, yeah, in the stocks. And what happened then is the, the value long only guys stepped in because at the same time you have these huge drawdowns, the mass business, that core like average yeah. Chinese customer, which is why you'd want to own these, these, this, this group long term, was still very strong. So cool. they stepped in and bought. The problem now is you've got about a 30% drawdown in the stocks. The problem is you've got a concession renewal. You have to get these licenses renewed with the government, right? So there's a lot of risk on that. So the long onlys, the value long onlys are not stepping in because despite like that great statistic, mm -hmm. the visitor statistic, they're worried about the risk of there being a big penalty with the renewal or the American companies. This is a narrative I've heard and I don't believe for a second, but the American companies will get screwed by the the, the government because oh, yes. of the trade war. Yep, yep, so yep. I, my advice would be, you know, I don't know if you want to catch a falling knife, even though the fundamentals are great. Uh, but if there is a resolution in this this trade war mm -hmm. between the U.S. and China, the stocks will pop that day. They're not going to stop going up. Oh, totally. Because mm -hmm. then you're going to get the long only value guys just well, powering into these light. stocks. Yep. And it's a, exactly it's a green. So you light. either have the green light there, or you have the green light, which is just the cycle. So for people that don't know the China Sloan call, don't forget that it. You know, the, the toughest of that is in the end, uh, the first quarter of 2019. Yep. So that, yeah. you know, we're not that far away. And isn't it amazing that the market, you know, the Chinese stock market's crashing, now the Hang Seng's crashing. People, when they have to go risk off on a major macro factor, they effectively say off, okay? And what they'll always do is capitulate at the bottom and sell low. I mean, you could have bought, uh, during the last Chinese economic slowdown, you could have bought, if I recall correctly, these stocks at a dollar. Yeah. Oh my like, God. Yeah. We, when we started Hedge, that's what Mar it was. Marsico no Capital uh, marked the low on Las Vegas Sands at a buck ninety-seven. Oh, they sold it. That was March 9th. The March low. 9th. The oh, low. Yeah. That's when the world was ending. You remember that? And actually, I think, if I recall correctly, Keith McCullough came out positive on the market not too on long March, after, and it just March took 9th. off. Yeah. You know, God called. <laughs> yeah. Uh, God called with quadrant <laughs> analysis. Yeah. 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 One. No, but that, that, that's a, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. It's not like you have to make that, that kind of a call. But people yeah. can get, in as much as when they go up, I mean, they yeah. just seemingly never stop going. Well, up. you guys always make the point, and I don't always listen to it, unfortunately. But, you know, even though I can make the claim that the, the sentiment or the, the Chinese economy doesn't affect the fundamentals as much, like, it, it hits the sentiment really hard. So you get the sharp multiple contraction, the stocks mm -hmm. go down. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened this last time around. Yeah. What's gonna, what, what do you think, or what will be... Once you get into 2019, what will be the cheapest uh, stock with market cap as a plan, Macau? Well, I think if you look at real valuation. Like 19, 20 yeah. multiples. I, I that's your whole point. Yeah. Long term, the, the numbers are high. People are pointing out that wind's really cheap, um, and, and it is. But mm -hmm. I think LVS is cheaper because LVS is less than two times leveraged. Right? So if you're looking at free cash flow yeah. yield, yeah. and that's the metric that a lot of people use, I mean, LVS, if they levered up to where a win is or levered up, they would be the cheapest stock in my entire universe. And it's a you know, $40 billion company with an incredible, you know, obviously, balance sheet, but free cash flow, and it's got growth. You know, mm -hmm. And it pays a 6% dividend. You know, it's cheap on every metric, uh, but people have this risk um, aversion of this, this concession renewal in an American yeah. company. Yeah, but you could also get new concessions in Japan. You could get, like, there's positive And they options. are number one probability. I'd put it at as high as 90% that they get a Japan license because they do the convention business mm -hmm. so well, and that's what Japan wants. And Japan, by the way, I was in Singapore when the J Japanese delegation was looking at the casinos there, and I would argue maybe the most iconic building in the entire world is 
um, so Marina, Marina Bay, Bay Sands, Sands in Singapore. In Singapore. And that beautiful pool. Oh, up so top. cool. Oh, it's great. My kids <laughs> loved it. I brought them there once. But did you guys see the movie? Um, it's kind of a sappy movie, but this uh, uh, Crazy Rich Asians. I haven't seen oh, it. Oh, no, it was good. The feature. It takes place in Singapore. The feature of that movie was Marina Bay Sands. Yeah, they kept cool. showing it in between every scene. It's and beautiful. then they had the final party up at the pool area. Yeah. Right there. So you and I had some fun up there. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I tell you. All awesome. Right, let's uh, take uh, let's maybe have some time for some questions for Tom. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, first question here, uh, you, you kind of hit on this. Is LBS your favorite long, I presume? Or uh, it's my favorite Macau long, but favorite Red Macau. Red Rock is Red Rock Resorts Triple R is by far I think got the best fundamental long term setup. Um, I don't think U.S. gaming stocks perform well in Quad 4, mm -hmm. so keep no, that in mind. But uh, if you just look at the outlook for same-store growth, it's the best macro environment of any gaming market in the country mm -hmm. with the metrics that matter. Mm -hmm. Moreover, you've got the highest population growth in the country and the highest percentage of retirees moving to Las mm -hmm. Vegas, and they have time and money, so that's good. Yep. And then the kicker is this tax reform, which has really whacked a lot of people in California. And Southern California is already the biggest donor of population to zero income tax rate Nevada. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and people don't move there overnight when you have tax problems. Like, you get your return, ooh, this sucks, maybe I should sell my house. Then the next year you get your next tax return, and you're like, forget this, now I gotta, you know, I gotta get a job, I gotta sell my house. Yeah. It mm -hmm. takes time, but you're already seeing the migration, and we've got the stats. We, we have a special database where we track driver license surrender. So when you move to Nevada and you surrender so your, California your, your California license, and this data set is projecting really good population growth. So, and by the way, there's no new supply. Nobody can build. Yeah. It's regulated. You cannot build new locals casinos. Now, we're not talking about the Strip. This that's is all true. Las Vegas locals market, yeah. so residential casinos. Well, that's what, uh, so for yeah. those of you that don't know Red Rock, the ticker is like, Triple it's a triple R, and it's the it's it's like the Las Vegas locals market. Uh, the other thing that's interesting with our macro call is that if we're right and inflation peaks, and interest rates peak, you know we're at a three-year peak, and everybody's like, oh my god, inf these things are going to go up. Yeah. So you should have been saying that three years ago, like yeah. we did, like we did. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> if those start to go down, interest rates go down, housing starts to reaccelerate. Oh yeah. yes. And that's <clears throat> another great way to play. Yeah. And housing Las prices already are the, leading the nation in the Las Vegas metro area. And, and, wow. and they, affordability-wise, fully loaded with taxes. Yeah. I mean, the, Still affordable. I know plenty of people that are... Uh, yeah. what, yeah. One more stat um, that's interesting. We've, uh, we do a lot of stats work, as you guys know. You guys mm -hmm. do, too. Mm -hmm. And the number of construction workers in the Las Vegas area is incredibly correlated. A huge R square, huge T stat to gaming revenues. So what happens is Vegas is a boom or bust on construction. Oh, yes. And it's been bust for the last two years. 16 and 17 were the two of the worst years for construction. But I'm not talking about casino construction, but I'm talking about like, you know, housing. transportation, yeah. housing, everything. Uh, 18 is up 60%, I think, year over year. 500% will be up in 2019, another 500% in 2020. The biggest infrastructure project ever in the state of Nevada, Project Neon, it's this highway, off ramps, exit ramps, uh, the Raiders Stadium. Oh, yeah. Which is which actually a good catalyst for the strip, too, the yeah, Raiders, totally. when the Raiders come in. Um, all these construction workers, they don't have enough in Vegas, so they have to import these people into temporary housing. They have nothing to do at night. No, they totally. go gamble. We've yeah. seen it before. So that's the other thing that's yeah. kind of if held Vegas if back. If you're a construction worker in Las <laughs> Vegas, what else are you doing? What else are you going to do? <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying everybody in the world drinks drinks beer like uh, some guys that we know now drink a lot of beer. <laughs> yeah, likes beer. Like uh, beer. Who was who that? I don't know. I, I, I drink beer, uh, but you know, so do my buddies that work construction, yeah. and they like to gamble, yeah. and they like to smoke, and they like to gamble. Well, how about gambling and free beer? Sure. It's even better, it's right? Free, yeah, exactly. Free. Well, free beer. Yeah. I, I like free beer. Yeah. yeah. Prefer yeah. Those uh, as well. You're going out on limo with that one. Please don't judge me from a partisan perspective. Indeed. Uh, moving along. Let's move along. Uh, on the flip side of that, what is your uh, favorite short in, in the space? So we don't like regional gaming at mm -hmm. all. Uh, right now, uh, Boyd's one that we we uh, do not favor, and um, and the hedge funds um, like it. We get a lot of heat on that one. Yeah. BYD Boyd. Yeah. Uh, I I actually like. You used to like it. Yeah, I used to love. It. Yeah, they they had. All the, all the opportunities in the world, cost cutting, um, redoing their marketing, and they've done all that. That's the issue. It's like now we're, we're back to like what's important, what's the driver, and it's demographics. And the demographics, unlike the Las Vegas locals market, uh, millennials don't play slot machines, right? And baby boomers are dying. I'm shocked. And the local, the, the, lo the regional locals outside of Las Vegas is just a market of baby boomers, right? Mm -hmm. And that customer base is shrinking, not growing. 
Um, so even in a good economy, you're getting flattish GGR growth. Now you'd be able, be able to offset that with some difference differentiating your marketing and, and also cost cutting. But we're, we're like late inning on that. Mm -hmm. you know? How are you gonna leverage, especially with wage inflation coming, totally. how are you going to leverage no growth? And they've done the consolidation thing. Now, you know, let's roll up and you know, we know how dangerous that is. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're in a spot now where the prices of, of private casinos have bid way up. And, way up. and everybody acknowledges it. So mm -hmm. now you're back to like, what is the core business? How do I drive, you know, how do I leverage no growth on the top line? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a for, uh, well, it's actually, I, I guess one other, um, one other question, because I had had it. Last week, uh, one of your shorts worked again, Carnival Cruise oh, yeah. implosion. What, wh why, why would this company not have to continue to guide down? Because some people keep telling me, okay, look, nice call, you know, now it's a long. Yeah. But to me, you know, like how, th nothing's a long unless I have growth accelerating, or at mm -hmm. least slowing at a, a slower rate. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, I tend to agree with you, and we'd be looking for, for another short opportunity, but you also have to remember the timing. We are approaching wave season. Right, where 60% of the business for next year will get booked, and this takes place between this early December and March. Yep. March. So we have a, uh, Felix has put together this great proprietary pricing survey, which is in depth, and it has completely different methodology than what the street uses, which is much better, so we can see better inflection points. Mm -hmm. Huge amount of supply coming on next year, right? So if it's gonna show up, it's gonna show up during this wave season. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we'll have that call. Now, if the economy's really strong. Because oversupply would lead you to lower yields. Yeah, lower yeah. Yields, so yeah. There's, there's so many ships uh, being built um, in the future too, but there's so many ships coming online next year. And we think that the, the people that are booking early, you know, as in this year before wave, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna book no matter what. They're just planning, they've timed their retirees probably, they, you know, they're just getting it on the books. But the people who all of a sudden start to see all these deals because it's really competitive, that's, you know, that'll be where you see the pricing pressure. And that's gonna start you know, in December. We'll be doing, you know, we'll probably do more frequent updates on that pricing survey to see if supply is having uh, a real impact. Mm -hmm. And if it is, yeah, I mean, you've got, you've got pretty, pretty big downside to these mm -hmm. stocks. Now the offset would be the economy. Yeah. You know, if we were to just sustain this level of growth, which I think is you know, extremely unlikely, but if we were to, um, that's going to help because um, mm -hmm. most of their customers for Carnival are in the U.S. Although they do have a sizable European business too, mm -hmm. which let's not overlook that. And that's it's Europe, like a, Euros now. And, and European, actually, Europe has a huge amount of supply growth too, because that, yeah. that could be the real short angle. Right. Because yeah. you have what is it? Almost a third of their business. Yeah, exactly. Is, is for this Carnival. guy? Yeah. It's like a PM um, remembers all these like little bits of data. <laughs> <laughs> I got to remember something. Why. I got to remember what time it is to drink beer. <laughs> I, I do believe we have two kegs tapped back there. Keith. Well, if we go to the wrong casino, they might have to pay us double, ah. pay double for the beer. Yeah. I mean, it's, yep. uh, have you they never started to charge for the beers? No. Oh, my God. That would just be the end yeah. of Las Vegas. That would yeah. be the end. Although, when you're in the sports book, you got to show your ticket before oh. they. Oh, you do? Totally. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. yeah, that's something. Jeez, jeez. All right. Cool. He's Todd Good. Jordan. Uh, yeah. Thanks for tuning in. Anytime you have questions, he's at, at Hedge Eye Snake Eye, by the way. That's how you can find him on Twitter. Great long, short ideas, as always. And, uh, Thanks for joining us today. This is, uh, I think today, it's, is this the end of it, guys? Are we good? Yeah. We're good. Well, thanks. Thanks for joining us for the first day of the first investing summit at Hedge ITV.